characters. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an ID episode, and we're going to be talking about OT priorities and defense in depth. And to walk us through this conversation, we brought in an expert for everybody. We brought in Jonathan Norn, who is a business and industrial IT group manager at Rovis's. So welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, how you doing today? It, you know, it's a great day. Nice go. weather, and we're talking about one of my favorite topics. Well, you were highly recommended. We had we had your colleague Graham Staples on talking about smart microgrids. He was like, "Look, you got to talk to Jonathan." He was adamant that that you would be the guy to talk to for this OT priority discussion. So I'm excited. All right. All right. Me so, too. so let's get started about talking about OT networks in general. What are those major priorities? So uh, the major priorities for an OT network uh, primarily consists of accessibility and reliability. Um, operators, you know, that operate these big machines and on these industrial plants, they need to be able to access the critical infrastructure that's been prepared for them um, when they need it. Um, really, nothing should ever get in the way of an operator making uh, decisions that can potentially mean the difference between saving or having to throw away a product or a batch. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, following on with that, then, you know, after this kind of idea of accessibility and reliability, um, and uh, then it needs to, you know, it also needs to be consistent. Um, I've actually personally witnessed um, times where, you know, some minor UI change has caused an operator to hunt around or, or not find a button or, or whatever they need to do to actually do what they've been asked to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that, that priority, you got to put yourself into the mindset of the person making the product, right. uh, person who's actually down on in the, in the trenches as it were. For sure. For sure. And I, and I know a lot of times when we, we open up this whole world of OT networks, that opens up the, the can of worms around IT too, right? So, I mean, it's almost you can't talk with one without talking to others. So maybe for the listeners out there who, who are new to this, can you highlight some of those major differences that cause potential friction between those groups? So, sure, absolutely. And that's, that's you notice I didn't mention security in the, no. in the previous bits of priority. Yeah, you left that um, one out. <laughs> I left that one out. Because, uh, you know, that, that's not generally the, the top of the priority list for the OT side of things. Um, I just, you know, backing it up just half a step, uh -huh. kind of a quick definition. I kind of categorize the OT side of things as all the networking and infrastructure required for direct manufacturing. Okay. And then, I, you know, the IT side of things is all of your business networks, all of your internet facing things that that, uh, you know, you come in, you need to print an email, read an email, um, those kinds of things all kind of sit nice and prettily in your IT network. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, with that kind of idea in mind of, of what those definitions are, um, you, can, you can start to see where the, they have different priorities. You know, OT, as I mentioned, is, has in order accessible, reliable, and then security, you know, kind of in that order. Whereas IT is the exact opposite of that. They, they want to be secure first and then reliable and then lastly accessible. Um, you know, as far as IT is concerned, they, they will, without reservation, shut down the network to an entire office building uh, to prevent the spread of a virus or other kind of cybersecurity intrusion. Um, but if you were to take that same kind of, you know, pull the plug mentality on an OT manufacturing network, you could potentially get somebody killed or, or injured as you're, you know, um, get, pulling the basically pulling the plug on equipment or the communications on equipment mm -hmm. uh, that need constant communication. Um, you know, or or you know, maybe not as dire. You you may end up just actually kind of damaging some of the equipment, you know, say you, you lose a heater to an extrusion um, and all of a sudden now you have to spend days or weeks chopping, you know, hacking out the materials that were left in there. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, 
kind of understanding you, you, that's a dual cost. First, the cost of the damaged equipment. Second, there's a cost in downtime be that kind of go beyond the initial threat. There's, there, there can be a little bit of friction that way because uh, downtime is not really um, something that IT always thinks about in the way that manufacturing thinks about it. They live in, manufacturing lives and breathes by this downtime, you know, yeah. minutes and hours can cost, you know, thousands and millions of dollars. Right. Um, and, and with IT, it's, it's it, the infrastructure, I guess, I don't want to say it's not as critical because it is it is pretty critical, but the the direct one to one downtime is not always the, has the same cost. You see, I guess to me that's what throws me off so much because I would think if you're an IT and you're in a manufacturing plant, you get the point of the plant is to make money, right? And if production's down because of something network related, you know, I would I would want just naturally think that would be a priority, but you're, you're right though. Cause it's not. So if that's a, a known rub and a known friction point, uh, what do we do about it? You know, how, how do we address that? Because we can't just leave that elephant in the room without addressing it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we shouldn't, we've seen, we've seen lots of instances where people, you know, like to do actually do that. Sorry. Um, I, you know, along what you just said there, we, I actually know, it, I, we went into a facility, we were invited in, and they were starting to tell us about this one particular IT individual, he came in um, at the end of the day, and he was replacing a switch, and he didn't quite finish configuring it all the way and went home, and uh, come back the next morning, and, you know, they found out that they couldn't quite they couldn't produce anything that entire night. Uh, nobody could get a hold of him. He came back in the morning and they'd lost many, you know, the whole overnight of production. Um, you know, he didn't quite understand the severity of what, what was going on there. Sorry, I feel like I was rambling. No, that's a great uh, story. I mean, <laughs> keep going. So maybe pick up with the aftermath. What happened? Because that's... <laughs> This, this is it. This is a wonderful example. Yeah, there's well. So in that particular case, um, they they let him go, um, and they they the manufacturing side of things decided to take a more, um, I guess, direct interest in their own infrastructure. Right. Um, and that's that's kind of one of the things that that I always recommend is that you know the manufacturing you. In manufacturing, you're responsible for all of the equipment, and and I honestly like to include the networking. I know that a lot of manufacturing facilities don't have perhaps a network at, expert on on call, right? Um, but but having that responsibility, keeping it within the manufacturing side of things, um, you know, is I, I think benefits the, the manufacturing side. I have some very good friends in IT um, and, you know, but IT oftentimes, you know, has a little bit of turnover. And when you're, when you're recruiting IT, um, you don't, you don't necessarily see manufacturing experience in there. So every time you get a new person in, you have to kind of re-explain the, the same like downtime. And, and honestly, there's nothing like living through a downtime that you caused to make you really appreciate the, downtime is not a good idea no doubt you know and when you think through I'm, I'm trying to think through the manufacturers out there and to give them some good advice you got these it professionals and as you mentioned there potentially could be some a high turnover in that but you also have your ot group and if they're not aligned on certain areas is it is it an education and awareness thing on both parties to you know i mean how where should we as manufacturers where should they be working with their IT group to to bring that awareness of, of the OT priority? And conversely, the same thing for the OT. OT needs to be aware of what's important to IT as well. So, you know, is there anything that we could do uh, from the manufacturer standpoint to really facilitate and be intentional about bringing those groups together? Absolutely. So the first thing I will say is there's actually a bit of a language barrier okay. um, between the IT and OT side. 
Um, I've seen it happen where, you know, IT has its own specific lingo, as does manufacturing. And when you get into that day and day and day, and then you try and go and talk somebody else's lingo, you, you invariably make a mis, uh, misstep. Yeah. Um, and, and so I've, I've actually seen, I've been sitting in a conference room where, you know, manufacturing is requesting something from their eyes. Uh, you know, using the words and terminologies that they know right. is perfectly reasonable. And IT is going, no, we, we can't do that. We, you know, and then, you know, having somebody else uh, sit down and kind of, okay, well, this is what they meant. This is what they're really asking for. Then IT is like, we can do that. That is something we can absolutely do. And, and we're like, yes, you know, we thought you could. Uh, but you have to ask in the right way. You have to basically ask in their language. And um, so, is and, that like think, a moderator or translator then to to really? Um, almost, yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of that's kind of what it is, you know. And uh, I've been in several instances where, you know, actually that's that's kind of one of the things that I do is we we kind of moderate that. We take information that we understand from from the manufacturing side, and we kind of take it over to it and and play go between um okay. and it's not something that you know it it's it is bah, let me back that up it is something absolutely that anybody can do um you can it's it just takes a bit of time to you know understand it speak or manufacturing speak right and then and then work through that so, I mean, uh, who's the best type of background? What not who? What are the best type of backgrounds to to be that moderator? Because it sounds like to me, you have to have almost a sand uh, a foot in both sandboxes. You you got to be able to know the process, you know, down to really what's important and speak that manufacturing language, and at the same time be able to understand when the IT guys get to talking about the CIA triad and what's important to them and, you know, uh, you know cybersecurity and all the, the different things that are, that are important to them and bring that together. So what, what does that look like? I mean, how do you get those skill sets? Um, my, the, it depends on where you're coming from. Um, so I, I have seen IT individuals uh, go, you know, manufacturing. So what, what, what I've seen them do is actually go and participate in a manufacturing, like a process control project. Okay. Um, you know, that gives them like firsthand in the trenches experience with, with, you know, operators and all that kind of stuff so that they can really, uh, you know, not just understand up here, but really understand deep down, like how that works. Yeah. Um, you know, and then they, they bring their it knowledge in with them. But but the, it's kind of tempered by this, you know, in the field knowledge. Um, you know, I, I know that's that may be asking uh, asking a lot of individuals who didn't sign up to necessarily go and do a manufacturing project somewhere. Right. Um, but but honestly, that's that's one of the best ways I've seen to kind of convey that that knowledge, that processing knowledge. You know, get in there and do a project with them. Yeah. Um, you know, take, take the, instead of taking the mindset of, Hey, we need to run this all through my security filter, you know, take the mindset first of, Hey, let's, let's do it the way the end user needs it to be, and then figure out how to secure it. Got it. Um, so that, I mean, that's from the IT side of things, from the manufacturing side of things. Um, I think they have it a little bit easier. Um, to be honest, because they start with that inherent knowledge of, you know, of the manufacturing process and all that kind of, uh, you know, responsibility that goes with it. Uh, but then bringing that back and adding in some IT knowledge yeah. uh, kind of kind of really helps, um, you know, getting some, you know, starting with understanding very low level how how the ones and zeros, how the little electrons travel on the wire. Right. And then, you know, cause nothing's ever progressed beyond that. We're still moving ones and zeros over some kind of wire. That's right. So understanding this fundamental and then bringing it up to more of the IT security side of things actually, I think gives them the, them a leg up. Now, will they ever be the ones that are out there securing Perhaps our our uh, AT and T and Verizon or our big cellular brands. No, right. But will they be securing 
uh, our manufacturing sites. Yeah. And will they be successful at it? Absolutely. Well, that was, that was outstanding. Cause my, my up was going to be, does one have an advantage over the other? Uh, you know, so far as being that moderator and connecting the dots. And it sounds like if you have that, that OT, you know, manufacturing process background, it may be easier to, 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 you know, build that bridge to have that conversation with IT uh, to, to make the connection versus the other way, and just based off what you were just going through there. Absolutely. I, I, I stand by that one, but I, but I'm going to caveat yeah. here. Oh yeah. Um, put an asterisk out there. Put an asterisk out there. Exactly. <laughs> so um, this all relies on having a, a comprehensive security policy or, you know, defense in depth, which was kind of the second part of what we were talking about. So, you know, when we, when we design OT networks, um, we typically will um, design a, well, we always design a defense in depth. Um, we, we design this, basically, we put, we take your secured assets, your secured networks, PLCs and everything, and we, we wrap layers of protection around them. Okay. Basically, the idea is that in order to, to get through to the, the device or whatever that the, you know, either malicious or unintentional, um, both are, are serious issues. Right. Um, in order to, for those to actually take effect, they have to get through all of these layers. And one of those layers, uh, I always say this within the manufacturing facility side of things, one of those layers is always IT. Hmm. Now, I, the way that we like to structure it in the defense, doing the defense in depth is IT is kind of an outer layer. So, you know, they don't necessarily control all of the inner layers, mm -hmm. but at some point we hand up to IT and allow IT to do its, uh, the thing that it does best, IT security. Because mm -hmm. um, it, it would be foolish of us to, to not take advantage of the expertise and knowledge that IT security specialists have in keeping networks secure and safe. Mm -hmm. um, we, I have seen instances where IT has pro proven such a roadblock that a plant manager will come in and install a DSL line straight to the outside so that they can get, um, so that they can get uh, you know, some kind of connectivity that they, that they want. Um, wow. and, and I, you know, in that, in that exact example, you're, you're basically removing one of your strongest layers of protection and exposing yourself to the outside world. And we, we strongly recommend against that. Yeah. No kidding. I mean, so if you're a manufacturer and you're hearing that and you want to start implementing that defense and death strategy, you know, as someone who does this for a living, what, what, are, what are the best ways to get going? So one of the, the best way of getting going is to understand what you have and what you want to do. All right. It, those sound like simple things that perhaps you should already know, but I, I can't tell you the number of places that I've been that don't actually know what's out on their network, what's, you know, out on their floor. Right. You know, they may have an idea. Okay. Well, this is a skid that does that, but they bought that skid from an outside vendor. So, how much of the equipment that's on that skid do they actually know everything about? Um, and, you know, beyond that, um, so taking, taking stock of that and then deciding what you want to have happen. So, you know, any, almost anything is possible um, in the terms of technology, right? right. So, um, you know, do you need, somebody, an external vendor to have access to this skid, maybe not that skid, or do you need to have, you know, your historian data flow up? Uh, you know, does it need to go into SAP? You know, you kind of need to define all these data flows. Um, and, and I know it can be daunting and that's, you know, that, that is one of the reasons why we have seen people who to this day have unsecure networks is because kind of getting that first step of understanding can prove a, a big hurdle. Right, right. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people say, oh, well, it, it's air gapped. I don't know if you've heard that term before, but that's sure. basically 
where the, the OT network and the IT network or the outside world are not connected. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've seen that. And, and um, you know, those, those networks are, I, won't, I will not call them secure because they are not secure. Maybe they are more secure in some ways uh, than, you know, ones that are, follow the like converged plant wide ethernet model or, or something along those lines. Um, but, you know, th- those types of networks don't defend against uh, USB, um, anything else that can, you know, propagate on the network or, or bad devices. Right. Um, I, I, one of the things that I say a lot is, is I don't know where these PLC manufacturers get their network cards from. They're, they're like, they're like bargain bin network cards. They found somewhere. I don't know. And maybe you shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't say that, <laughs> but um, anyway, they, then, then, the network cards fail on these, you know, very expensive devices. And sometimes they spe- they fail spectacularly taking down the surrounding equipment. So it's not always just um, external threats that you have to worry about or, you know, purposeful or accidental. Sometimes it's, it's uh, failures within the equipment. Right. Right. Now is it, so if you, if you're sitting back and you're a manufacturer, you know, we, you mentioned a CPWE, um, I've also heard things about, you know, the, the NIST framework to, to help, uh, you know, trying to get everyone aligned on the right strategy. How does that fit in for, with defense and death? So the, the NIST framework, um, you know, right there in the name, it, it tells us it's a framework. Um, I, I like, I like using NIST um, in the sense that it gives you, if you check all the boxes within the NIST framework, you've got policies, you've got, you know, securities, you've got all these different things that will help protect you. Um, and one of those is a de- defense in depth um, strategy. So defense in depth fits, you know, well within the NIST framework. Um, the NIST framework just gives you the guidance and kind of the peace of mind that you've, you've at least explored all your options. Right. I got you. Now, give give the listener out there, Jonathan, that that wants to start working down a road towards maybe IT or OT, you know, but they want to be get in that industrial network space. Uh, where do they need to start investing their time? Um, that is a really good question. It depends on where they're at. Uh, so one of the first things that we do, we like to do is uh, segregate and separate all of the different processes within the plant. Um, most of these networks that we see from anything that's over five to 10 years old, they're organically grown and there's nothing wrong with that. We, we start with, you know, oh, well, we have one device and we need it to talk to this device. Mm-hmm. And we go from that to, you know, having five or six lines and, and um, you know, multiple cells and all these kinds of, you know, we grow into a full plant. Right. Um, and a lot of times these are done by people who are not as familiar with networking that are learning on the job, which is again, uh, amazing work. Um, but I would, I would actually start down there at that level and start breaking them apart into functional areas. Okay. Um, you know, we, we've, we've seen a lot of shift in the way that, you know, process control happens over the past 20 years. And, and I think our security and our, our networking needs to follow that where we, we break it into isolated, you know, process areas. And um, that in my mind is a really good first step. For sure. um, and then, and then beyond that, you know, as you start interconnecting things and bringing in your historians and your centralized authentication and all that kind of stuff, you know, you, you start being able to expand and grow um, a lot more easily because it's all separated out. I actually, I can, I, can, I can think of two facilities off the top of my head who had this, you know, organic growth, and then they added a new line and it brought the whole plant down because they had run out of, you know, address space or, or duplicates. Um, I think another one that I, I, I can think of um, was maybe a little bit more embarrassing where um, 
they plugged in a standard HP laser jet printer and brought their whole manufacturing floor down. Oh, wow. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that, that, that making that first step of separating things out and, you know, this line is going to be this address space and this line is going to be, you know, this network and kind of doing that so that everything's a little bit protected. It can be difficult, but there is definitely value to it. And it allows you to, to grow your network no doubt. and your facility. Well, that was a powerful example. I mean, I, I can't imagine the look on the guy's face when uh, he plugged that guy <laughs> in, right? I yeah. Mean, oh, wow. Well, this, is, this has been just a phenomenal conversation. You've really shared a lot of in- insight on OT priorities, defense in depth, Jonathan. And we call it Eco Ask Why. We, we, we wrapped up with the why. So maybe help our listeners understand why is understanding those OT priorities and having that solid defense and death strategy crucial for success? Because, you know, these it's a, it's a competitive market. And if we can give a good why to the, the manufacturers listening, uh, that may get them to start moving in the right direction. Absolutely. So the why this is so important is because this should be something that's in the back of your mind with every decision that you make. Um, you know, you as a manufacturing facility, you, your first priority is to make product, Mm -hmm. but in the, in the top five priorities has got to be maintaining security and defense in depth, as you know, and we've seen more and more out on the news lately, there are a lot of bad actors. Um, and you know, because of that, as well as unintentional accidental things, we, we really need to keep this in mind. And if you design with this, it's not an onerous thing to, to do. Right. If, you, if you have to retrofit, that's when you start having to have additional plant downtimes and more expenses um, just to go back and redo the things that you've already done. Right. Uh, so that's why I think it's important to just always have this in your mind when you're, whenever you're doing a new project or you know, when you're generating you know, new uh, standard operating procedures, anything like that. You need to have these ideas in your head of uh, how are we going to protect this? How are we going to uh, make sure that it's used properly? I mean, it really is the world we live in now. I mean, you cannot forget that piece when you start moving and, and, and implementing a lot of these projects and initiatives. So hats off, Jonathan, you did a great job of explaining that for the listeners. <clears throat> For the listeners out there, check out the show notes. There'll be great ways to connect with Jonathan, with Rovices. They do phenomenal uh, support in this in this area of, of industry. And Jonathan, thank you again for your time today. Of course. Thank you. What a great conversation. My key takeaway from Jonathan was you need to know what you have in order to really build a good strategy moving forward. So thank you for, for him for joining Now, we're still collecting those war stories. Hit us up on Facebook and Instagram. We really need to hear from you so that we can put together something that I know you all will love. And if you're loving Eco Ask Why the way I hope you are, hit that five-star rating, leave us a good review, and remember, keep asking why.